All right, welcome to week two. This is week two of Terminology Dump Day. Yay. However, um, it's not quite so bad, but it's basically all the terminology you really need to know when it comes to database. Last week was general concepts about data. This week is just words, but they're important words. Uh, words you probably want to remember. Uh, I did send out an announcement that the slideshow was updated because I realized I uploaded a very rough draft because I was thinking of redoing this slideshow and I decided not to because the old one was good enough and the new one was a shit show. So might as well use the old one that has everything you need on it instead of me having to recreate everything. So we are going to start right at the top. And I'm going to talk about attributes. And attributes are data points. Remember last week when I spoke about data? I talked about how everybody has data. Everything has data. And when you want to think about things that can be put in a database, you've got a person, a place, or a thing. <laughs> a person, a place, or a thing. Um, that thing is usually an object of some sort. Now, all these things have something called attributes. An attribute is a property or characteristic of an entity or a relationship type. We're going to pretend we're not going to see the word relationship type for now because it's not really that important. However, the word entity is the important one on this slide because entity is the definition of an object. So this could be a, the definition of a person, the definition of a place, the definition of an, an object, a thing, or something else. And there are a few different kinds of attributes. And there's certain classifications when you think about them. And they fall under the categories of required versus optional. Now, a required piece of information, for example, for a student, is probably, I don't know, your name? Maybe followed up closely in second place by your date of birth? Uh, those would be required attributes, optional attributes. On the other hand, are things that we'd like to collect and keep track of, but not necessarily need. For example, here's one that's kind of come out of the depths of history, a fax number. I don't know how many of you have actually seen a fax machine in, say, the last five years. Sort of. Yeah, exactly. But you don't see them. We used, everybody used to even have one at home for a while. Why? Because they were so handy. You can save yourself long distance bill by faxing a letter to your mother. That was my wife, by the way. So it was like email before email. Um, so that's required versus optional. You got simple versus composite. In other words, is it a simple value or is it a complicated value? I've got more information about some of this stuff further slides. Single valued versus multi valued, stored versus derived, and then identifiers. So now I'm going to go through. Uh, some of the stuff. However, there's one other piece that goes with this, and it's the constructs. And there's three pieces of constructs. And a lot of people ask me, why do I start talking about attributes before I talk about anything else? It's because people understand attributes. They really do. They go, well, what is your name? That's your attribute. On the other hand, I turn around and say, well, okay, what's what kind of entity are you? And they go, I don't know. And they usually would follow up as, what is an entity? Well, then, I'll be talking about those in a minute. However, an entity is a, a thing, a person, a place, or an object. And there's a one phrase below that, which is an entity instance. For example, if I describe students as an entity, each of you are an instance. So when you go start talking about a database, each row is an instance. So every collection of attributes about an entity is an instance. So in other words, you have a name, you have a date of birth, you've got a, you know, some sort of identification number attached to you, you're that instance. You've got a name, you've got a number, you've got some sort of identification number, you're an instance. But however, I can vaguely describe both of you the same way which is, you know, you're a student that has a name, a number, and a 
but it's not the specific. It's not like numbers one, two, three. It's this is a slot to hold a number as opposed to the actual number. The entity type is a collection of entities, which ends up mapping out to a table. In other words, you guys are basically as a whole make up an entity type. In other words, all of you put together, collected up in a bin, is an entity type. An entity type is a collection of instances, and the definition of each of those instances makes up the entity. It's all terminology and verbiage. But, you know, these are words that you might cross here and there in the industry. Relationships are connections between entities. How are things interrelated? And then there's a relationship type, which is what kind of relationship is it? So I'll be talking about those later, not as important. And the attributes I already talked about. And this slide is redundant because I just explained the whole thing. All right, so there's no point repeating what's on that slide. We just saved ourselves five minutes. An entity, on the other hand, there's a few things when you think about an entity. An entity should be an object that will have many instances in the database. In other words, if you're going to go model something that only ever exists once, and only once, don't do it. That's not something that belongs in the database. For example, you want to go and you're going to create a database entity that describes one tree and only that one unique, nowhere else in the world, tree. No. What you should do is model trees as a whole. That way you can collect the various pieces of information about it and that's what you want to create. An entity should be an object that's composed of multiple attributes. It's kind of pointless modeling an, a real world object that only has one distinguishable piece of information. There is a place in the database for those kinds of tables and objects, but they, they becomes more at the implementation side. At the design side, you don't design an object that only has one property. Can you think of anything in this world that only has one property? Honestly? Anyone want to come up with an idea of something that's only got one property? I can't. It's not a trick question. It really is a question. If I have one of these days, someone will actually say something. Yes. Now, see, you thought about it by an extra 10 seconds. Really? Weight, color, composition, type of rock, dimensions, density. Yeah. So, model things that are made up of multiple properties. An object that we're trying to model is something you should actually create. In other words, students, teachers, classrooms, courses, that kind of stuff. That's stuff you want to model. However, what it should not be, for example, a specific user of the database. You don't want to model an entity just to contain George, the shipping guy. Why? Because George isn't there forever. He might get retired. He might retire himself. He might get hit by a bus. George is not forever. However, a shipping person is a concept that's there forever. Well, at least until we stop shipping physical goods. And then there'll just be somebody who presses a button and goes, send to the person's printer. But until then, you don't model actual physical people or users. You, you model their role, their job. And you shouldn't model an output. And people say, well, what do you mean by an output? The actual reports that come out of the database. You shouldn't create an object whose entire purpose in life is to represent output. Why? That's what the applications are for. The applications munch the data and output in a, us in a usable, human-readable format. You don't design a, a bin for, imagine if you built a filing cabinet and it's only purpose in life. And the only thing you could ever do with this filing cabinet is store students' names in it. 
You can never even put an employee's name in it unless they're also a student. But even that's kind of breaking the rules because, you know, this, this cabinet only holds reports about students and they can't hold anything else ever again. In other words, you're lacking reuse. If it's reusable, it's well designed. If it's not reusable, it's badly designed. All right. So earlier I said I was going to talk about simple versus composite attributes. When you are doing initial design, there's two kinds of attributes you first trip up on. The first one is a single or simple attribute, a date of birth. That's a simple attribute. Your SIN number, passport number, those are simple attributes. They're not made up of things. On the other hand, an address is known as a composite attribute. Why? Because an address is made up of multiple things. So when people first start modeling, they'll come around and say, okay, I need to keep track of a person's name, their date of birth, and their address. Now, when I say to someone, what is your address? And don't tell me your address, but I say, what is your address? What's, what's, what crosses your mind? Your street, your city, maybe your apartment number, your postal code, your province, maybe your country. Yeah, same thing. So you think about six, seven things that make up an address. When it's time to actually shove it physically into the database, these need to be broken apart. But at the initial design level, it's known as a composite attribute. It's an attribute that's made up of many little pieces. It's like a little Lego block. You know, that one when your, your little brother or sister left a chunk on the ground, it was already half assembled, and then you want to cry. And then you might have dribbled in your pants a little bit when you stepped on it, because there's nothing worse than stepping on Lego. That is a composite attribute. When it comes to the time to put it in a database, you don't want to step on that piece of Lego. You want it to break that Lego apart, so at least if it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt less. Okay, multi-valued attribute versus derived attributes. All right, it's a slide that's got a lot going on on it. However, a multi-valued attribute is an attribute that can take up multiple values at the same time for a given entity. So for example, I look at you guys and I go, okay, so far some simple attributes is your name, your first name, your last name, your date of birth. You've got a composite address, composite attribute, which is your address. However, let's go with a, a multi-valued attribute. What courses are you enrolled in? At this point, we don't, we haven't broken it down to a new table yet, but you're enrolled in a list of courses. Most of you are probably enrolled in the same courses, theoretically. There might be the odd one in here that's actually coming in either as a rinse and repeat. Sorry, guys, whoever is a rinse and repeat. Or maybe you're coming in because you transferred in from a different program, you got exempted from a few other classes, and now you're kind of you're an in-between person that's you know traveling between the walls for the rest of your college career. However, you all have a list of courses you're taking. So that would be a, you know, you'd put it on and go, you know, introduction to programming, comma, database, comma, achieving success, <laughs> comma, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not supposed to laugh when I say that. In an ever-changing world. So that's a multi-valued attribute. Another one example would be your skills. What are you good at? What can you do? And there's different skills in the bunch, right? There's the ones that can play Call of Duty and win all the frickin' time by throwing the knife halfway across the map. It's a fluke. You've got the ones that can catch up volleyball easily. You've got other ones. <laughs> You've got other ones who have other skills that already know how to program a little bit, or they think they know how to program. you got other ones that think they know how to use a database, or they may not. Who knows? But you've got skills, and that would be a list of skills. That's a multi-valued attribute at this point. Later on, they won't be, but at this point, they're multi-valued because you're just starting out. And then you've got derived attributes. Derived attributes are attributes you can calculate. In other words, these are not attributes you store in the database. These are attributes you can calculate. Anybody want to come up with 
a derived attribute that applies to all of you. No, that's an actual real attribute. You, well, yeah, average height's a calculation, though. That's that's not what we're after. That's a note. That's a, what they call an aggregate. Age is an example of one, right? Because you store the actual date of birth of a person, and then you can go right now minus that value tells you how old that person is. And depending on how you ask the database, it'll tell you in you know years, months, days, or right down to it'll tell you you're this many seconds old. That's a derived attribute. Another derived attribute would be if you look at a receipt. I bought six kumquats at two bucks each. The line total is derived attribute because six times two is 12. Do we need to store the 12? Not yet. Should we store the 12? Depending on your circumstances. Derived attributes are sometimes stored and sometimes not. Um, traffic director. Um, so that's a calculation. Now, excuse me, identifiers. I spoke vaguely about them last week. Identifiers are a key. And it's an attribute, like everything else, right? If you're starting to see this pattern, right, why I brought up attributes first. Everything is about your attributes. It's an identifier. And it's an attribute, maybe a combination of attributes, that uniquely identifies a specific instance of data, a specific row in the database. So when you are working at the conceptual level, is what we're talking about right now, an identifier is a piece of information you can use to uniquely identify one individual collection of data. In other words, if I could read off somebody's student number, which is a unique identifier as far as the school is concerned, I could read it off and maybe you remember what your student number is and you'd go, that's me. And I successfully identified you. That's a unique identifier. The difference is between a simple and a composite identifier is a simple one is like your student number. One number, I got gotcha. you. A composite one would be a little harder. Let's just say with the database was designed really, really stupid. And to uniquely identify someone, I was going to look you up by last name plus your date of birth. Therefore, I have to say, anybody who's a, you know, whatever, Joe Blow, born on the 7th of March. Therefore, at that point, I got to look up two pieces of information. I got to provide two pieces of information to actually pull out a given record. So that's the difference between a simple or a single and a composite. The composite's made up of multiple pieces of information. The simple is made out of one. Anybody want to take a guess which one's the better solution? The simple? Uh, the, oh, hey, don't even need to be twins. Some of you heard the story how I was born on the same day as a person had the same last name as me in the same hospital, one room apart, within 10 minutes. And we're not related. Small towns. Nothing else, nothing else better to do, apparently, in April. <laughs> in northern Ontario. <laughs> um, candidate identifiers. When you're starting to do the design, you've got something called a candidate key. A candidate identifier. What does this do? It's when you're first doing the modeling and you haven't decided yet what the master key is going to be. So you look up various options. You'd have maybe your SIN number, your passport number. Or alternatively, uh, if you're a grocery store, you could maybe look at the SKU or the barcode. If you don't know what the differences are, the SKU is the number you punch in by hand for the produce, the barcode is opposite which you go blip. And, you know, that's the difference. They're both candidate keys, but are they, you know, completely good keys? Who knows? But they are candidate keys. Until you finish doing all your modeling, once you've done all your modeling, then you'll know which one's the good candidate key, which gets promoted. Because you know what? There can only ever be one primary key. 
how the others get their heads cut off. And that just aged me. <laughs> if you don't get the Highlander reference. Okay. Nice. Trying to avoid my microphone, I poured water down the inside of my shirt. I'm air conditioned. Okay. I thought I fixed this slide. All right. Composite candidate and primary keys. We're still going on the previous theme of the last slide. Now, earlier I said a composite key contains two or more values or attributes. Candidate keys are keys that uniquely identify each row in a relation. Okay, so far I already explained this fairly well and it's pretty clear. The primary key is where things get weird. Because depending on what your background is in database, the word primary key can be substituted with the word prime key. Why? I don't know. Just like everything else in the world, people have to have more than one name for the same thing. A prime key slash primary key is the candidate key that wins. It's chosen to be the key that will uniquely identify the row of data in the database. And it's actually going to be used by the database, the actual database server to uniquely identify each row. Hang on, I'm going to try, try to trap control you. There's one there, one there, one here with free jelly beans. And I think there might be one right there if you want to sit at the back and not be close to me. Okay. So now we got past what they call all the potential natural keys. Natural keys are keys that come with the data you're working with, such as your SIN number, your date of birth, that kind of stuff. However, as life would state, sometimes you have a case where it just doesn't work, right? School systems are a great example of this. There's nothing worse to model than college or university. Or universities are worse because, you know, you, it's even more complicated for some unknown reason. But in college, when you go mapping out students, you know, you've got potential candidate keys. Like I said, your student, uh, your um, SIN number, your visa number, your passport number, some other number. These are all numbers that you can use as a potential primary key. However, they're all candidate keys and they all have issues. How many people here don't have a passport? Okay. Guess what key just got eliminated? The potential key just got eliminated. Okay. Um, you know, how many people here don't have a Canadian SIN number? Don't need to raise your hand. I'm just using that as an example. I don't want to identify past that. But, you know, these are, these are all going to eliminate potential keys. Just like depending what country you come from, you also need a student visa. Not everybody here has a student visa. I don't know if anybody here even has one. But student visa number, those are all eliminated. So what, how, how do you fix that problem? You create something called a surrogate key. It's also known as a synthetic key. The, the old term is surrogate, the new term is synthetic. Why? Because synthetic sounds cooler. I don't know why, that's just, somewhere in the last five, six years, this, the term synthetic key has started floating up on the internet. Because you can't just keep calling something the same thing it's always been, right? A dog's a pupper. You know, a cat's a death with claws. It just depends who you work for. You go work for the government, it's going to be a surrogate key. You go work for Eastman Chemical Corporation in Houston, Texas, it's probably going to be a synthetic key. Basically, you come in, have your brain ready to accept either word. So I, that's why I bring up both words, so that you've heard them both. So what is a surrogate key? A surrogate key is a column that has a unique value that's been created and assigned by the database server. It's out of the hands of the programmers. It's not a number that exists anywhere else in the world. A number automatically. Um, and normally it's used as a primary key. Why? Because the numbers never repeat because they're generated sequentially. You want to take a guess? 
what your surrogate key is here at the school? Your student number. Your student number is a surrogate key. I've actually had a case where I once had one class with three students that had numbers back to back. Literally, like one, two, three. Not quite, but one, two, three. Um, and it just so happened that they were, and these guys were a postgraduate course, so they actually all lined up at the same time at the registrar's office, one behind the other to register. And since it was a summer course, they were just you know, coming in when nobody else is registering. The unique values of surrogate key are assigned by the database server every time a row is added, since somebody already stole my thunder. And normally, they're very short, they're numeric, and once it's assigned, it never changes. You cannot reuse a value from a surrogate key. It's just how it works. So you add 10 rows to the database, 1 to 10, then you add another 10 rows, so it goes from, say, 11 to 20, and you delete 1 to 10, you can never reuse 1 to 10. That's just begging for trouble. And which makes it ideal as a primary key. Why is it ideal as a primary key? Because it's never repeated. It's unique per instance. Which means you could theoretically have in the school system two people with the same first name, same last name, same date of birth, and still be able to pick the right one. Why? Because in your case, you have a student number. You just go up to the student number and they go, hey, your name is Dan Goudreau. Yeah, hey, though we got three of you in here. What's your date of birth? It's blah. Oh, we got two of those. Do you have your student number? Right. It's a lot faster to find you by your student number because there's no guesswork. Okay, foreign keys. Foreign keys are is an attribute that is the key of another relation. So you've got two entities. Um, we're going to go with student and locker. There's many lockers, but a locker can only ever be assigned to one student. So when you sign up, you get one locker. On your student record, there is what they call a foreign key, probably locker ID or locker number, whatever they decide to use. And the value stored in that field is the primary key from the lockers table. In other words, if the primary key is 5, because you somehow got magically locker number 5, and they show the value into your table, the user table, I mean the student table, that value in that field matches the value of the primary key elsewhere. So when you're talking about foreign keys, the value inside that field is always dependent on something else. How do you, can you think about this in a more real way? You all share your DNA with your parents, right? Half and half, hopefully, unless you're a cat, but half and half. And if you want to think about it, half your DNA is the foreign key to your paternal side, and the other half of your DNA is the key to your maternal side. And this, those are your parent records. They each have a primary key, which is their whole full set of DNA, and you inherit part of their DNA, and that makes you your foreign keys. I mean, I'm really super simplifying-ish and kind of, you know, making it a little fuzzy, but that's essentially how it works. Uh, when we start playing with actual physical data, it'll make a lot more sense. Okay. When we're talking about picking out identifiers, so we're going back to the whole primary key thing. You want to choose identifiers that, number one, will not change in value, and number two, will not be null. Right? So, for example, back to the your SIN number. If you're not a Canadian citizen, your SIN number is null. Therefore, SIN number is not good because it's eliminated by the null thing. Have you guys learned about null yet? Sort of? Maybe? Null is an absence of value in a defined space. Like the inside of some people's heads. If you self-identify, well, I feel bad for you. Or a SIN number nowadays can change. 
there once was a time where your SIN number was immutable. However, thanks to uh, people that steal identities, it is entirely possible that you have to apply for a new SIN number. Why? Because they have your old SIN number and they have to kill it off. Therefore, your SIN number may change. Another bad identifier is your name. People's names can change. Whether you get married and decide to take your spouse's name, did you notice I didn't make that gender specific? Right, you can take your spouse's name in either direction. There's no legal requirement to not do that. Or you decide to identify yourself as a symbol. Artist formerly known as Prince. Your names change. It has no, I hate to say your name has no meaning, but your name has no lasting meaning because names are mutable. You pay like a hundred bucks and you can change your name. You can change your name every three years if you want. Today I feel like a Corey. Now I feel like a George. Maybe now I feel like Fluffy Pants. The names are mutable. They change. Therefore, they're not good identifiers. You should avoid intelligent identifiers, such as locations. How many people here still live in their childhood home right now? I'm not talking, are you living in Ottawa temporarily? Because right now, you're not living at home. How many of you are still technically living in your mother's basement? Couple, right? Okay, there's actually some, enough people are willing to be honest with themselves. But nothing wrong. It's cheap. It works. The day you were born. Exactly. So, you know, your address changes. It's not a set value. Therefore, it sucks because it's an intelligent value. People can look up at the address. Oh, that's a great idea until you move. And the other rule about it, you should substitute simpler keys instead of using big, long, composite keys. So instead of using first name, last name, date of birth, and postal code as somebody's identifier, give them a number. It's so much simpler. Can you imagine if uh, with all the driver's licenses, if all they based it on was your address and your name? And you didn't actually have a driver's license number? And then you move, and you get pulled over, they try to send you a ticket, well, they can't find you anymore. Ha, ha, ha. My address changed. Um, but that's, you know, how things work. Yes? Can't use their SIN number. Remember when I was talking about surrogate keys? That's what you do. Oh, I know, I answered for you. It is, but it isn't. There are edge cases out there where people's DNA don't match on their skin to the inside of their bodies. And it's the real thing. It's not just a make-believe thing. It's not something that just showed up in CSI one day and they said, hey, it's actually real. Yeah. No, it's called a chimera gene, and it's normal. You have your mother's skin DNA and your father's skin DNA on the inside. Depending on who you ask. Uh, usually you'll use composite keys on associative tables. So when you're connecting teacher to set to a course to a set of students via a section, therefore you'd have a composite key of student course teacher. So yes, technically you can do it. Uh, depending on where you work, they won't allow it. If you work with certain languages or certain development frameworks, they won't allow it. Um, just depending on what kind of work you do. If you do a lot of web work, I can guarantee they're not going to allow it. It's just how it is. All right. Now we're going to start, start talking about relationships. And believe it or not, I'm actually going to slot in a 10 minute break in here somewhere. Because there's just so much terminology, your brains are just going to. Okay, cardinality of relationships. Okay, now when you talk about relationships, you're talking about how are things connected. So how is a person connected to an object or connected to a place? They're, or how is one person connected to another person? Those are called relationships. And there's three common kinds of relationships. 
There's one to one. That means that we have two entities, and there's only allowed to be one to one. In other words, there's an instance of a teacher, and let's say instead of being a one to many, which I'll talk about in a second, so one teacher to many students, it was literally one to one. I could ever only ever teach one student at a time. Can you imagine me doing this lecture 172 times? Crap, that would suck. I'd get so good at it though, but it would really suck. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. It's not used very often. It's slightly frowned upon. Um, it's often used for extending a database structure where they don't want to mess with what's there originally. It's an excuse. Um, it's also used for security purposes where you can separate sensitive data out of the main entity and have it float by itself. And when it it's time to actually physically implement the structure, it actually becomes um, a standalone object that can be locked down using security. That means that even if you get a breach where they can read, say, the customer's information, they can't get their credit card, their SIN number, or tax IDs, or anything like that. That tends to be where you use one-to-ones. They're almost never used. There's the one-to-many. And then if the, the one-to-many is the go-to end relationship 99 percent of relationships out there are one or one to many for example one teacher many students and you can apply that to your family tree also you know mother can have many kids father can have many kids also but you know, that's a different problem However, it's one to many. A person can buy many bananas. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in about uh, one or two slides. So that is one to many. In other words, one entity has many entries as child records or child instances. A person goes to the grocery stores and buys many pieces of produce. So he buys, you know, five pounds of bananas, a bag of oranges, a bag of carrots, you know, two pounds of apples, which is like two apples. But they bought many products. They go to Amazon, place an order. Whoever buys only ever buys one thing off Amazon. Yeah, well, we do, but, you know, it's rare. That's a one-to-many relationship. Many-to-many -many is the relationship that must not be spoken about. The many-to-many -many means that one entity is interconnected with another entity multiple times. So that means that I'm connected to you, you're connected to the whiteboard. The whiteboard's connected to you, and you're connected to me. This zigzag of connections between two objects ends up being this big, giant spider web. And it's a mess. These get resolved using an associative table later, after the design process calms down a little bit. You tend to want to avoid many-to-many -many as much as you humanly can. Because what happens is the records between two entities ends up being so interconnected, it's like going to Kentucky and going into a town and you discover everybody's related to everybody else. And then you need to get rid of someone and you end up wiping out the entire family by accident because you can't tell who's who anymore. Ding, ding, ding. But that's the example I tend to use so people understand why you don't do many to many. It's bad. Because you just end up with this tangled mess of connections. And when you have database rules, they tend to have cascading rules. In other words, if you delete a parent record, it takes out the child records with it. But you may end up having a case where a parent's related to a child, which is related to the parent of another child, which is related to another parent of another child. And you delete this one, and you end up losing half your data. Why? Because it just keeps cascading through and over and over and over again. That's why you don't do many to many. It's really, really bad. So when we're talking about database relationships and I'm getting modeling relationships, which one are you going to use 99% of the time? 
Actually, as far as I'm concerned, 100% of the time for this course. One to many. All right, which leads me to the cardinality rules. Excuse me. Cardinality constraints. This is where we start explaining what the rules of engagement are between the different tables. We know the two tables are related because we drew a line. Whew, we're smart. We drew a line. We know the two objects are related to each other. Good job. However, now we need to establish some ground rules. And some of these ground rules follow as follows. Follow as follows, duh. The rules basically state how many instances of one entity can be associated with other instances of entities. So big definition, not a lot of explanation. The minimum cardinality explains whether or not the relationship is required. For example, I can be hired on as a teacher, and I'm hired to hire to teach courses, but I haven't been assigned a course yet. But they have a relationship between instructor and course, but right now the relationship from instructor to course is optional because I could be hired and exist without having courses. Therefore, courses is optional to my existence. If I turn around and flip that to a section, a section requires an instructor. If you don't have a section, if you have a section without an instructor, which you know, let's pretend you, that's impossible. That means that the relationship between myself and this section is required. This section cannot exist unless there is an instructor. So that's the required, not required relationship. And then you've got the maximum number, which is kind of weird, because you know what the maximum number is? Zero, one, or many. So pretend we're living in the, the jungles of South America and we know, only know about one, zero, one, or many, because that's what our math skills are capable of doing. So the maximum number is zero, one, or many. In other words, I could have theoretically zero students, one student, or many students. And going back to the example she brought up, a mother can have many children. Like the textbook said, they use daughters, but a mother can have many children, but any given child can only ever have one mother. A mother may, well, they're not a mother then, but a woman may choose to never have any children. Therefore, the relationship from mother to child is optional. You can choose to never have a kid. Therefore, relationship going that way is optional. The mother may choose to have a kid or not. Therefore, the child side of it is optional. On the other hand, once a child comes out into the world, whether they live with their mummy or not, they got a mummy. Because I don't know where else they came from. And therefore, the, the relationship from the child to the mother is required because it's impossible for the child to exist unless there was a mother involved somewhere along the way. That's probably the most straightforward explanation between required, not required, many to one, as you can get. Now, there's some symbology involved, and I'm actually going to draw them on the little whiteboard. Because, you know, that doesn't look very clear looking at my screen here, and I doubt it looks all that clear at the other end. So this notation, whoa, stop. This notation is known as crow's foot. There are currently, last time I checked, seven different database notations. This is the one that's used the most in teaching. Why? Because it's the simplest one to understand. <coughs> there are two popular ones out there, crow's foot and then UML. And nobody knows how to use UML. And then there's all the other weird ones that get used up in odds and end places. And I pray that you never need to deal with it because they just don't make sense. Crow's foot on the other hand makes lots of sense. Okay, we all know about... I'm going to draw my four lines here. Relationships, that's our line, right? 
That's our relationship. It connects a couple of things. If we want to say that there are many, I'm actually going to do two of these. You draw a crow's foot. Then you take a guess why it's called a crow's foot? Because it looks like a bird foot. Or literally, that's why it's called a crow's foot. They were really original when they came up with it. Oh, well, in case you can't see, there it is. Now, that's the crow's foot. Now, let's see if we can get this to actually go nice and fat. There we go. Crow's foot implies many. Okay? There are many records at the other end. When you have a single line like this, the single T bar, that implies one. And actually, it's kind of obvious, right? It looks like a one crossing off the line. That's a one. The other piece of this is the optional portion of it. So this defines the maximum numbers. The other one defines the optionality of it. Mandatory many. There must be records at the other end. It's no longer optional. There must be at least one at all times. Probably more than one. This means it's optional. Back to the whole, a mother may choose to have children or not. She's two. She can choose to have the kid or not. Now, there once was a time where it was this option. Whether you had kids or, well, you had kids. That was the choice you had. Nowadays, you can or can't. It's your choice. You can have many kids or not. This one here is, there must be one and always one. This Picture it on the other side of the equation where a child must have a mother and it can only ever have one biological mother. This is the, at most it can have one and it's optional. Uh, what's that situation that, that you don't, tend to get those very often where it's optional on one end but not it's only one but it's optional it's rare um, usually you'll get that in the case of uh, what shipping method was used for an order the order comes in it gets placed but it hasn't been shipped yet therefore we don't know what shipping method they're going to use therefore at this point the shipping method is optional but obviously when you get a parcel sent it can only be sent by one courier service of some sort therefore it's one courier but until it's been shipped it's kind of optional what it is does that make some vague sense okay the social entities that's a slide that's got an awful lot of text on it all the texts an entity has attributes a relationship links entities together. So, so far we know we've discussed how an entity can have attributes, right? Everything in here has got attributes of some sort. A relationship connects different entities together. Now, an associative entity is used to connect the many to many thing, to avoid Kentucky. In other words, you have a situation where you have a crosshatch. A teacher teaches many courses. A student participates in multiple courses. And you, end, you could end up with this weird zigzag where you know, you've got multiple students attached to the same course, you've got multiple courses attached to different students, or vice versa. And you end up this weird mess of data. Instead, you create something called an associative entity. And there are two types of these. There's something called an associative entity, which is straight up, all that's inside of it is the primary keys from the other tables. So, for example, you got a you got a character. So we're playing a video game. All of a sudden, we've got a character. The character has skills. The associative entity, all it would have is the character's ID and the skill ID. That way, it maps between the character and the skill. 
It's like a little lookup table between the two. By this table, you always know all the skills a given player has. You can also use that table to find out what players have a given skill. It's fairly straightforward. And you can blow that out to three tables, four tables, such as a course section, right? You've got students, you've got an instructor, you've got a course, um, you've got a room. That's actually four entities that land into a single bin. That could be just a straight up associative entity because all it's made out of is the primary keys of all the tables that feed it. There's a one level past that. And that's known as a relationship with attributes, also known as an entity with attributes. <laughs> well, you know, it's the same thing. What a relationship with attributes slash an entity with attribute does is it's an associative entity that has more information inside of it. For example, um, back to the whole section thing. So if we have our little section table, right, where we know um, we have the students that are in it, what course, what instructor, what room. What happens if we add some extra data in there? Start date, end date, uh, day of the week, when is it scheduled, when's in that room? Those are extra attributes attached to the associative entity. Suddenly this associative entity isn't just an associative entity because it's got data that's specific to itself. Then becomes an entity with attribute that serves as an associative entity. It's just phrases and words, but it's phrases and words that are important because of its job. Now, some basic rules. When it's an associative entity, all the relationships should be many. In other words, it's the receiving end of many. So it looks like this, theoretically. Can I not win with a decent... Eraser. Entity one. One. Entity two. I'll turn it for you guys in a second. Entity two. Then we got our associative entity. That's an associative, that's what it means that this one, the relationship feeding into it is always many. So this one has many of these, this one has many of these. However, each instance, so every block of information inside of it only ever belongs to one combined pair of the two, like such. When the associative entity has meaning outside of the primary keys, that's when it starts becoming an entity with attributes or an, or an associative entity with attributes. And its purpose in life is, like I said, you could add dates. You could add other information as in start date, end date, active, not active. For example, students are registered in CST 8215 for this term. Bang, you're associated to that course. The term ends. Click, you're done. For some unknown reason, next term, you're back in CST 8215. You're going to add a new entry. But if you were just using the primary keys originally, and you just so happened to get me as a teacher a second time, you know, you'd have the same student ID, you'd have the same course code, you'd have the same instructor. Now you need some extra little information in there to keep track of whether or not this is the active record we should be paying attention to. Uh, the entity can participate with, in relationships with other entities. In other words, they could be connected to multiple things at once. And I'm going to skip that last line. Why? Because it's a horrible word. Um, essentially, a ternary relationship is what I've been talking about with the teacher, course, student, because it's a three-way relationship. As you can see, the sign that says break is over. The break sign went away, now it's time to keep going. This shouldn't take too long. There's a lot of slides, but there's a lot of pictures on these slides, so it's not too bad. Those of you that have already experienced my lab, have already lived this, some of this already, 
This is going to be a little bit of a review. Those that haven't had this lab yet, you're going to be way more prepared than the guys yesterday to do this lab. Okay, what is an ERD? An ERD is known as an Entity Relationship Diagram. It is documentation. It is documentation used to represent the database in an abstract manner. What's its purpose in life? Is to give an overview of what the database contains. Not the nuts and bolts. It's a simplified diagram that explains how things are interconnected. The goal is that it's a diagram you can present to an end user. And by end user, I don't mean the person like that's going to be using it right at the end. For example, where I work, we contract out. I can't say quite contract out. We create, so we rebrand our, our, our branded software for other people. They're called OEMs. And we're, they resell our software with their name on it. And sometimes we have to do some custom modifications to it. And what we do then is we pull out the database diagram, one of these to show them this is a customer, this is a vehicle pattern, and you know this is where we store the stats. You know, I'm really abstracting here, but we have a diagram that's really simple so we can talk to the, pro the pro product manager at the client and explain to them, this is how we think the data is laid out. Then we go through the diagram and they kind of go, oh, I don't understand. And then we spend another hour doing it and then suddenly go, I think I understand. Then you discover the next week they didn't. But, you know, the goal is to at least try to make the interconnection between all the information understandable to a layperson. It's also really useful as a tool for the person creating the actual physical data model because they actually can look at this and go, Ah, here's the abstract. I know how to connect these physical things together. It's a first step. Um, I've used it as an example. You know, anybody here ever do creative writing? Every year the group gets smaller. Fine. I've done it. I've been published in a magazine once. I got paid 26 cents. Hot damn, it was awesome. Asimov's a science fiction magazine. It was fantastic. I have no copies of the story. It's a very sad day when I found out my mother cleaned up my room when I went to college. But saying, as when part of the creative, the creation process is you write a story outline or you create a mock-up. So if you do graphic design, maybe you do a mock-up before you go for the final design so that you can look at it and go, that's a stupid idea. It's a complete shit show. Or maybe you're doing creative work for someone else. And you do mock up say, I could do this, or I could do this. And you know they're going to pick the ugly one, but I could do this or this. Those are mock-ups. An ERD can be used as a mock-up of the database. It gives you a rough idea of what's happening. So what is an ERD? The conceptual data model represents the data that's used in our own organization and how everything's interrelated. It is a graphical representation of the proposed database. So this we're talking about here, there's two names that keep getting thrown around. There's the conceptual and the logical. Depending on who you ask, they're the same thing. Or they'll quibble on the definition of logical versus conceptual. Conceptual doesn't have attributes, logical has attributes. Somebody also say the conceptual has attributes because you haven't given it a data type. When you give it a data type, then it becomes a physical. Or it has attributes, but we haven't resolved the many-to-many -many relationship. We haven't created all the other little bits and pieces, like broken out um, compound attributes and stuff. So it becomes from conceptual to logical to physical. Now there's going to be a big blob of text appearing on the screen in a second. Please don't panic. Seven minutes late, guys. Seven minutes. I hope you feel guilty. If you don't, you do now. <laughs> yeah. 
So step one when you start diagramming is you want to identify the entities. And one approach is to work through an a chunk of information and find out the words that which you think correspond to entities. In other words, if you're given a, a spec, and I hope you get given a spec when you have to do this kind of work, and you're not just pulling ideas out of the air, out of the ether, like whoop, idea. You read through the text and you sit there with your little highlighter and you highlight the things. But they're already highlighted on the screen. And you sit there and you highlight them, whichever color light works for you. And you can highlight the different colors with different kinds of entities if you want, but realistically you highlight everything you think is an entity. And in this case, there's a big blob of text. A company has several departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. So if we look at these two sentences, we talked about a company, we talked about a department, we talked about how there's a supervisor and at least one employee. These are people and, and places and things and objects. Employees must be assigned to at least one but possibly more departments. So far, there's repeated words in here. We haven't seen any new words. At least one employee is assigned to a project. Oh, there's a new word. That's a thing. Highlight that one. But an employee may be on vacation, not assigned to any projects. When you read this, you're also hearing some basic rules about how things are interconnected. The important data fields are the names of the department's projects, supervisors, and employees, as well as the supervisor and employee number and a unique project number. So this, all this information is given to you. And realistically, there's a few ways I could have done the highlighting on this, but this time as I was talking about entities, I stuck to entities. But I could have used three different colors, one to highlight the entities, one to highlight the relationships, and one to highlight the actual data points. And for example, if you want to talk about relationships, I wish I had a pen. That's a relationship, my awesome drawing mouse skills. These on the other hand are fields, right? They even says the word fields, the names of this as well as number and unique project number. I mean, come on, give me a break here, it's a mouse. Actually, my circling skills aren't much better than the mouse. But, you know, these are points. You just start highlighting. You can use different colors to do it. And then what happens is, this is a really old tool. Really old. I'm talking, we used something really similar to this when I was in school. This has not changed. Um, nowadays, the perk is I didn't have a whiteboard when I was in school. Now you could use a whiteboard to do it. Or you could use Excel, which is what they made us use. Actually, no, sorry, it was Lotus 1, 2, 3. That's what we had to use. We used a spreadsheet to do to emulate this process. So what you do is you want to create a matrix that has rows and columns for each of the identified entities. Anybody here ever participate in a round robin sport or tournament, whether it's a real sport or an <coughs> e-sport? Or even worse, Magic the Gathering? Or UGO, because I draw a pot of greed. This card allows me to draw two more cards. And then pull out some more. But you've participated in a tournament. Therefore, you've seen round robin grids. It looks just like this. You know, you've got the same values going left to right, and the same values are going top to bottom. And essentially, obviously, the grid up the middle here is a dead zone. So you create yourself a grid like this. Obviously, if you're working with a huge database, this gets really complicated. But you know, if I did it as an initial pass, this would probably work. And then you continue. So you go through each cell, and then you look at the words back on our slide, you know, two slides ago, and you compare. And you can say, well, an employee belongs to a department. The department is assigned to an employee. The department is run by a supervisor. Nowhere that they talk about projects, so there's nothing to be said. A supervisor runs a department, well, and there's nothing there. Uh, the employee works on a project, and the project uses an employee. 
they're verbs that we can identify from the document and we can fill it into the different slots. We suddenly, what did we just do? We just identified the relationships. So if we can turn it around and actually write these as sentences, you can actually take that little box and write it as a sentence. A department is assigned an employee. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to a department. An employee works on a project. A supervisor runs a department. And a project uses an employee. Do you notice all, these, all this information I got out of that little paragraph? It's a lot of information that just came out of that one little paragraph. So now we have all these bits and pieces. So then we draw the rough ERD. Now, those of you that were in the class yesterday in my lab have seen these symbols before. Congratulations. You can sleep for the next 30 seconds. Entities are shared in rectangles. Diamonds and lines are used to re represent the relationship between entities. Here's a general example. An employee works on a project. Ta-da. We've established a relationship. Now, to take this slide and to diagram the whole thing, it turns into this slide. Man, it looks way better up there than on there. So you can see that a department is run by a supervisor. A department is assigned an employee. An employee works on a project. Now you can see, based on this, all the bits and pieces, how everything is interconnected. Those were the sentences that we had previously. Now it's a picture. Now imagine you're dealing with someone whose English is a little on the weak side, where they can't understand sentences that have five words in them. But you can show them a picture and saying, these are the things, and this is how the things are connected. Then you go, this is, how everything, this is how this enterprise is run. And by some, saying someone who can't understand five word sentences, I'm talking about project managers. And even better, the guys that work in marketing. Because they don't understand three words. You always have to assume the lowest common denominator that the end user is a turnip. And whoever you're explaining your concept to is a turnip. And if you're lucky, they're a rutabaga. But this is the most basic diagram. That's a non-attributed diagram. Therefore, you want to talk about what is considered a, a pure conceptual diagram? That is a pure conceptual diagram. It has no attributes, no extra information. Entities and how are they connected? That's a pure conceptual diagram. Now we go back to the cardinality. So, you remember when we read through the document, it talked about, you know, numbers? Each department has one supervisor. Each supervisor has one department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments, which is actually pretty common in the private industry. In the government, you ever, ever belong to one department. And it's like hell to get out of that one department. But in private industry, you belong to multiple departments. Employees can have one or more employees. Uh, departments can have one or more employees, right? And each project can have one or more employees. And a project, each employee can have one or more projects. So after we do our little symbology, which I erased, we end up with something that looks like this. And this is actually the mythical one-to-one -one relationship, which somebody was asking me about, and I think that was you. Which actually, this is really stupid, by the way, but it's a great way to illustrate it because the paragraph said that each supervisor is run by, each supervisor runs one department and only one department, and every department must have one supervisor. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Each department is assigned to an employee, and an employee can belong to many departments. This is the many-to-many. -many. Later on, uh, we'd resolve this using an associative table. But for now, this is many to many. In other words, each employee can work at multiple departments, and each department can have many people. Some people may only belong to one department, 
or not. But it's saying a department cannot exist unless it has at least one employee. That's what this is right here. And apparently there, an employee cannot exist unless they are assigned to a department at least once. So that's what that's saying. And then the end, an employee can work on a project or more than one project or on no projects. However, each project must have at least one employee but can have many employees. So when you think about the symbology and the terminology, if you were to come, so if you want to try to understand these slides, what my recommendation is, is look, look at the picture, go read the sentences, go look at the picture again, and see what sentences don't make sense to you, and then try to work it out from there. It is like learning a new language, but it's pictures instead of words. So, so far, we have a basic ERD that now has cardinality and implementation rules. So then, remember when I was doing my fantastic highlighting job, my little pen, my marker, which is called a mouse? I identified the unique identifier. So that's what that stuff that was at the bottom of that paragraph. Let me go back to that slide. Down there. This stuff down here, right? Employees as well as supervisors and um, the supervisor and employee numbers and unique project number. So we know each employee has a number. So then we add these in. Now this is a symbol I didn't teach you guys yesterday. So this one's new. So you can now wake up from your nap. How do you do represent a unique identifier on one of these diagrams? You put on an attribute, which you know you guys have seen, the attribute goes in a circle. But what's different about this and the attributes I showed you guys yesterday? There's an underline. Mind blown. Right, so they went for the simplest way to de designate that this field, this attribute might be special. There's something different about this attribute. And what is different about this attribute? It's an identifier. So look at this quick and dirty little diagram. What's the fastest way I can show someone that this field is special? Underline. There we go. So now we have entities with their relationships and we have their unique identifiers. It's all set up. Bang, we got a diagram. Now you identify the attributes. Now it's a big slide, lots of text. I'm going to turn around to read it like this. Actually, not hurts. Um, so when you start identifying attributes, you want to go identify name all the attributes essential to the system that we're studying without trying to match them to their particular entities yet. So what you do is you go through the whole document and you go, oh, this is an ad, this is an attribute. They talk about names here and they talk about you know employee numbers there. Oh, we already took care of employee numbers. You know, what's their salary? That kind of stuff. So you spend time identifying all the attributes, all the things that are that describe something. And then, coming from a purely technical side of it, like from the real world, often when you're implementing a new database design, you're given a stack of paperwork, samples, forms, things like invoices, receipts, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, product brochures, that kind of stuff. And then you spend time with it, with your friendly little highlighter going, chick, 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 highlighting everything that you think is an attribute. Then you got this big pile of attributes. And then you cross out the attributes that aren't important. Because sometimes there's old crap that keeps getting carried forward and you're implementing something new. Get rid of the craft. If it doesn't need to come forward, don't take the baggage with it. It's just garbage. Now, what's left is the stuff you need to actually model. And then the most important part, <laughs> and I just got nailed on this one because I thought nobody used this field in our database and I just nuked it recently, like Monday, because I had a brain fart. I didn't ask if anybody ever used this piece of information because I didn't see anybody update it in ages. 
you look at all the data. And then what you do is say, this is everything I've managed to identify. This is the stuff I think is not important. And then you ask your end users, am I missing anything? So, and I don't mean talk to your boss if you're modeling a new shipping system. Maybe you go talk to the guy in shipping. Because, you know, he might have a slightly truer perspective on what's actually happening when that box goes out the door. When he watches the FedEx guy play oh, with the box. You know, they have a truer perspective. Same thing if you are dealing with data entry or accounts entry or order processing. Go talk to the people in the front lines. They'll have a better perspective on what data is actually important. Because you might have gone through this and say, oh, look at this. We've I've gotten rid of 10 fields and we don't need any of these anymore. And there's still 15 fields left. You go to order entry, they say, now nah, you'd only need five of those fields, but you need those three that you thought weren't important. That's called the data verification step. So going back to our big wall of text, like seven slides ago, the attributes that were indicated in that paragraph were the names of the departments, projects, supervisors, and employees, and the unique numbers, which brings us to the final version of this diagram. It's fully attributed at this point. It's really blurry, and it looks terrible on the slide also when you actually look at the PowerPoint presentation. A little hard to read because there's just so much on there. This is the fully described version of the diagram. Now, here's what's a little weird that you may not notice. This table wasn't here before. And this table is essentially what would also be used as an associative entity. In this case, they decided not to use the associative entity symbol because, believe it or not, well, this is coming from a set, a set number of slides, right? I didn't draw these diagrams. They're coming from a, an existing set of slides. There's this particular notation is known as the Chen notation. So Chen was a computer scientist 30 years ago, 40 years ago or more. And he came up with all the symbology saying, this is how you draw these conceptual diagrams. And he never created a symbol for associative entity. So what did they? So a lot of people that teach using the Chen method don't use the symbol for associative. If you were actually going to use a slightly the, what they call the revised Chen methodology, Lord help me, I'm going to try to draw. Oh wow, that sucked. And again, let's see if I can do better. There we go. That was definitely better, but not by much. The box of the diamond inside, those are known as associative entities. These are the associative entities. They resolve the many-to-many -many relationship. As you can see, there is no longer many and many on both sides. It's been resolved as a separate entity that's associative. They also created, you know, they carried forward the primary keys. Employee number, project number from these, and this is why it's an associative entity. It's a compound primary key. This is what as complicated as it gets for the diagram, for this side of the diagram. Essentially, and you're doing yes. Oh, shoot, it should have gone here. That's the um, associative entity, which is made out of the two primary keys of its parent table. That's why there's two inside of one. So that's a compound a primary key. There is a different way of drawing it, which would be 
One. Two. That's your alternative way of drawing the same thing. The old Chen method uses one bubble with two keys in it. The new method is two bubbles with underscores. They're both completely valid. Just saying. However, if you're going to start using the modern notation, use the modern notation throughout. Don't mix match. Because then you look like a fool. Then it really sucks to look like a fool. Just putting the thought out there. Okay. Anybody want to take what the last step is? You check your results, right? You go, does oh, this make sense? So you look at your diagram and you try to put yourself, you do a little bit of role playing and you put yourself in the shoes of the person on the other side of the table. You go, is everything obvious? Is it is it clear? Is it understandable? And then you go through your cardinality pairs, make sure you know the one to many, many to many business is all resolved and it all makes sense. And then you just want to double check, make sure all the attributes are there that should be there. And that should take care of drawing a conceptual diagram. While you've done this, you've learned all kinds of things about the database. You've learned about its entities. You've learned about what makes up the different data points. You've grown a, a nice, cozy understanding of what the data actually is. It's such an important aspect when you're doing database work. Because not understanding the data you're working with leads to problems. Because if you don't know what you're working with, you'll make mistakes. How many people here have tried to do something without actually not understanding what they were doing? How many of you succeeded? Let's be honest. Maybe you succeeded on the, the one time. And then, and then you don't succeed the second time because you got lucky the first time. But that's, you know, the process. You double check, make sure you understand what the data is doing, what it's about. You understand what an attribute is. You understand what a candidate key is. You understand what you know the primary keys are and the compound attributes and all that jazz because you took the time to actually massage the data and play with it. 